Kaspar Koto and welcome to this Getting On Board webinar. My name's Helen Bartle and I'm the Senior Advisor for Audience Development and Capability Building at Creative New Zealand. It gives me great pleasure to introduce the third Getting On, Web Getting On Board webinar for this year and the topic today is Board Dynamics. Today's webinar will be led by Graham Narkis, as always, from BoardWorks International. Graham, as you may know, is the author of the Getting On Board Governance Resource Guide for Arts Organisations. It's great to see so many of you on the webinar today, and throughout the course of the next hour, we'll be finding out how board dynamics can help, can both help and hinder board performance. We will break for questions midway through. Um, you're currently on mute just to avoid any background noise, but if you do have a question, just note it in the public chat box on the left-hand side of the screen, um, or you can tell us you have a question and we will unmute you so you can um, ask it uh, during the question break. Both the recording of this webinar and the PowerPoint presentation will be made available via Creative New Zealand's website, so don't feel that you need to make copious notes. And finally, a note to let you know if you don't already that attendance at these webinars can also be used as a credit for CPD, Continuing Professional Development. So if board members belong to the Institute of Directors or another professional body, then obviously uh, credits can be used. And um, without delay, I'd just like to welcome Graham to the webinar and um, hand over to him for today's session. Hi, Graham. Good morning. Thank you, Helen, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this webinar. Uh, I'm looking forward to discussing boardroom dynamics with you because I hope I will uh, demonstrate to you it's a pretty vital element of effective governance. The structure that uh, I'll be following this morning essentially has these three uh, components to it. I want to talk initially about just the role of the board and to acknowledge that it is a social organism. Um, I really want to talk then about the role of group leadership, particularly the role of the chair in ensuring that the dynamics work well. And for the balance of the webinar, I want to acknowledge some of the particular challenges in relation to board dynamics and suggest some possible approaches to uh, working with those and making the best of them. The infamous American company Enron, which many of you will have heard of, it was one of the biggest companies in the US. The Lord of us is having one of the best boards uh, in the country only a few months before it collapsed and became worthless. On paper, Enron's board was, was near ideal. It was composed of sophisticated, distinguished industry leaders as well as widely recognized experts in areas such as finance, derivatives, accounting, uh, each of the directors had significant ownership stakes as well. The board seemed to have an effective structure and an ideal board and committee uh, framework, including all the usual paraphernalia like charters, codes of conduct, and the like. Uh, it was also acknowledged that the board met regularly, the board members were well briefed, the meetings were well organised, and the board members uniformly described the internal board relations as harmonious. Uh, obviously, though, something went badly wrong. I had the opportunity to watch one of the US Senate committee hearings into the demise of Enron. Summing up at the end of a series of presentations by the Enron board committee chairs, the, co the chairman of the Senate committee said, quote, you guys not only fiddled while Rome burned, but you toasted marshmallows over the flames, unquote. There's been many academic and other studies of the cause of Enron's demise. Uh, but that quote on the slide is a reflection on what we can learn from the Enron experience uh, by one uh, American academic. Uh, I found it a very good starting point for any board discussion about board dynamics because it underlines what brings boards and the organizations they direct down. Uh, what is, it, 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 it acknowledges that a lot of what is not tangible, visible, or measurable is the cause of that demise. It's dysfunction within the board's social system. Sonnenfeld, who that quote uh, I've attributed to, also concluded that, quote, what distinguishes exemplary boards is that they have robust 
effective social systems with a virtuous circle of respect, trust and candor. An important starting point for any discussion of board dynamics is to acknowledge that the board is a social organism, a group of people meeting together, only occasionally, which is a particular challenge for boards, and they meet to exercise a joint leadership responsibility. The board makes decisions as a group, and its members are collectively responsible for those decisions. How well they work together can have a profound influence on the performance and sustainability of the organisation they're responsible for. We shouldn't take the challenges inherent in this situation lightly. As John Carver, uh, the American governance theorist that some of you have heard me talk about before, once observed, most boards are incompetent groups of competent people. Negative behaviours, decision-making biases and blind spots and the like can all create destructive patterns that can impair board effectiveness even when all the right pieces and people are in place. In terms of, of those challenges referred to on the slide, uh, just acknowledging that the board is a social organism is, uh, is a good starting point. Uh, I think that sitting under good governance by any board is uh, really a process of learning uh, and engaging uh, the potential of each board member. And boards that are effective are able to develop expeditiously a collective consciousness about important matters and to accept collective responsibility for them. The other important element is uh, the role of management and uh, the board uh, that works well also works well uh, in a respectful, a mutually respectful partnership with its management team. So coming on to the role of the chair, uh, I really want to emphasise how important the board chair's contribution to uh, positive group dynamics actually is. The, the leadership of the chair of the board is a vital ingredient in the board's success or failure, and that's why the selection of board chairs, if at all possible, should not be left to chance the chair faces challenges that other board members do not. For example, one of the most challenging tasks and important tasks of the chair is to ensure the board is able to undertake the challenging work it must do in an environment that will give it the greatest chance of success. We can think of this as creating a context in which the board can do its best work. Now, there are many different dimensions to context. For example, do we have the right people around the table? Are we clear what it is that the board must work on? Do we have the information we need to support our, our analysis and our decisions? Even does the physical environment we're working in allow us to concentrate on the matters in hand and to engage directly with our colleagues? These and other dimensions are important to provide some assurance uh, that there will be uh, the best possible chance for group collaboration, for individual participation and contribution, uh, for us to take advantage of the diverse backgrounds that we hope uh, our board members would have, uh, even to deal with quite divergent objectives of those uh, board members. Uh, does it also support rigorous intellectual analysis and critical thinking and the sort of continuous learning that I was alluding to before? I guess we can make jokes about, but even board chairs who are, ma who are male must be able to multitask. Chairs must be able to pay attention to what the board is working on, in other words, the agenda content, and how it is working on that content, in other words, the meeting process. Chairs must be able to ensure that the board applies clarity of thought and thorough analysis to what are often quite gnarly issues. At the same time, the chair has to accept and manage the emotional content that is inherent in a board's deliberation on important issues. So the board chair has a particular role in managing those challenges. And there's four that I've identified, and I'll just go through them one by one. The first one is managing the status dilemma. You know, boards are theoretically a group of equals, but in reality, and for a number of reasons, there are status differences within many, if not most, boards. 
that can reflect the different experience or expertise of members or the length of time they've been on the board. It might also reflect other positions they hold outside of the organisation that they're uh, board members of. Uh, and the status and competence that goes with those external positions may be carried into the boardroom. Typically, some board members are simply more reserved, while others are more dominant. For some people, there may be an element of fear or insecurity that stops them from speaking up. For others, there may be an incentive to contribute rather more aggressively, searching for affirmation, for example, or trying to establish an identity within the group and prove that they belong alongside other people that they perceive to have higher status than, than themselves. So the thing that is important here is that uh, the, the chair keeps the status dynamics from hurting the quality of the board's dialogue. Uh, I think it's important they keep, or try to keep, at least directors out of any narrow expertise silo that they might naturally fall into. Uh, work hard to pull the various ideas and, and uh, seek out minority opinions and, and give proper time uh, to those minority opinions. Uh, and just encourage that collective commitment of the board, that everyone's uh, part of the same team. The various techniques that some of you will be familiar with uh, anyway uh, that a chair might use. So, for example, uh, calling on individual board members, uh, who, particularly those who might have been quieter. Uh, polling uh, board members. You know, we've talked about uh, taking straw polls perhaps before a board gets into decision-making mode, which is getting a bit of a an initial heads up from those who are participating as to what their starting positions are. And also a variety of pre-meeting uh, steps that the chair might take, like having conversations with individual board members to try and identify the sorts of uh, contributions that they might want to have, and then uh, drawing those out of those individuals at the board meeting if they haven't come uh, through naturally. The second one is, is uh, managing the, what I think of it as, an, as a structural tension between uh, the board and its management. You know, one of the most difficult things a board has to do is to be an objective and independent critic of management while also supporting them. Uh, board members must approach management proposals with a critical eye, uh, testing them by asking questions that might reveal potential shortcomings. They may even need to express disapproval of management proposals uh, at times. And at the same time, they must keep management motivated and feeling supported and part of the overall corporate leadership team. You know, I talked there in this, on the slide about the asymmetry of power because there's a flip side to that as well. And that is because the board is so reliant on management for essential information. Because of that, Dependency, in effect, it must sustain the kind of relationship that will keep senior managers bringing information to the board. If the board is seen as overly critical or as a, a nuisance or a risk that has to be managed or circumvented in some way, then the board undermines itself. So there are some techniques referred to on the slide. Uh, again, for a chair, uh, pre-meeting preparation is important. Um, I think also working hard to ensure that there is no them and us uh, type of feeling that emerges from either side of the board table. Uh, it's also important that a chair foreshadows the sort of uh, discussion and frames uh, the discussion that will come up so that there are no surprises and that any sharper uh, points uh, between board and management are managed in a more constructive and positive way. Also, integrating the discussion, in other words, showing how points of contentions, for example, criticisms that board members might uh, raise during the meeting fit into a wider purpose and are not intended to undermine or be unduly critical of management. And, and simply uh, for a chair, uh, something which applies continually in all circumstances is modelling the sort of behaviours uh, that will keep uh, that social organisation, social, social organism functioning effectively. The third one is, again, it's another paradox perhaps, but it's the need to sustain board cohesion or teamwork while encouraging a contest of ideas. To obtain the benefit of group decision making, the boards must be able to balance open discussion and disagreement on the one hand with group cohesion, trust, 
and efficiency on the other. This is made even more challenging by the fact that almost all of the board's work happens in the presence of another group, in other words, senior staff who typically would attend uh, the board meeting. So the board must be able to conduct its own work process in which the, the conflict of ideas is good rather than bad, to do that in a way that shows management that the board is not divided or confused, but rather a strong and credible group. So again, there are a bunch of, of techniques uh, that might uh, be useful. Uh, for a start, just simply keeping uh, the board on task and focused on substantive issues is important. Also, uh, as the discussion proceeds, articulate the end points, but also the points of disagreement. Uh, by doing that, it actually says that disagreement is okay and, and uh, anticipated to some degree. Uh, in terms of the board's own process, making sure that a dominant critic doesn't overwhelm the dialogue, so constantly seeking the views of other board members and perhaps management as well. Um, allowing that disagreement to exist, but not to allow it to disrupt. And in that sense, uh, although most boards probably tend towards a consensus style of decision making, taking a vote is okay. And the fourth and final one is just the ongoing challenge of managing what is essentially a fairly ambiguous role that a board has. The, the board's role legally uh, is spelt out in its constitution, whether it's the rules of an incorporated society or the constitution of a company or the, uh, the, the, a trustee of a foundation. Uh, those still need to be interpreted and operationalized so uh, the, the chair must ensure that directors are operating with a common understanding of the board's role, but also consistently with ideally some sort of agreed approach that the board will take. But at the same time, uh, acknowledging that circumstances change, situations change, and sometimes the way the board operates needs to change with those. Some techniques I've uh, referred to here. So be really explicit, and this is again the chair that I'm talking about. Be explicit about the purpose and the context for each of the board's discussion, each of the agenda items. And once the discussion is complete, be clear about what has been agreed. And again, as I commented earlier, model uh, the sort of behaviours that the chair expects from other people around the table. I think also from time to time, it's also helpful if the board sort of steps back a wee bit and philosophizes about the way the board should operate. That's particularly true when new members have joined the board. Uh, there needs to be a realignment process around those sorts of things. Um, Helen, I think I'll stop at that point and we might see if there's any questions. The try for that. Again. Okay, okay, so uh, I'll start again. So, so the question is about, uh, is there an example of the, the tension between board and management? Um, I, I may be misinterpreting that question because it's probably one of the most enduring challenges in governance. But you know, there, is a, there is a structural issue that the slide attempts to refer to, and that is that uh, the board has all the positional power, the, the, the constitutional authority, if you like, because the chief executive's role is a delegated one, but the chief executive and his or her team actually control the main resource that a board works on, which is namely information. So it's about trying to ensure that uh, the, the role definitions, the contributions that each will make, that the, the delegation that management has clarifies the respective roles and that uh, the, the chair in particular has a major role to play in ensuring that if there are any tensions uh, likely to arise in the course of a board meeting between board and directors that they have anticipated those, that's the pre-meeting preparation, uh, and that they frame the discussion in a way that actually invites management to expect that there may be some, some criticism or some points of uh, uh, contention, and that that's just business as usual, and it's not a personal attack on them. So uh, that's the sort of thing that's referred to in the uh, slide. The thing that the slide doesn't refer to, which I might have acknowledged as well, because we've talked about it in past webinars, is the 
perhaps the, the desirability of, of board only time before a meeting uh, so that uh, the chair can get a heads up from individual uh, directors as to things that might become um, you know, a source of conflict between board and management in the course of the meeting so that the chair can manage those appropriately. Now, and that's, that's probably all I need to say on that, but I'd be happy to, to uh, continue that if anyone wants me to. That's great. Thanks, Graham. I suggest if you have a question, just pop in the chat box you'd like to ask a question, and we'll just unmute people individually to avoid any further uh, feedback. But um, shall we uh, continue on for the time being and then come back to any questions that people have? Okay, that's fine by me. Um, so, the next piece of this that I want to explore a wee bit uh, is what you might see as signs of board dynamics that are not working particularly well. Uh, so, starting off with, uh, something that we've been talking about the chair, starting off with weak leadership at that level. So, poor direction and generally inadequate leadership of the board by the chair can mean that a board dynamics don't work particularly well. We've all seen how an unduly dominant personality can completely uh, distract a board and uh, someone who dominates board proceedings might be doing so not just because they're extroverted and talkative but because they also in terms of their, their behaviours uh, actually intimidate other directors or, or staff members uh, for that matter. And when that sort of um, behaviour is present, uh, there's a lot of uh, people around the table who will choose not to speak for fear of being beaten up in some way. Politics, um, yeah, that's something which uh, we see in a lot of boards. Uh, but a board in which there are factions uh, typically means that people are not open to differing views and information that does not support their particular agendas. The uh, excessive conformity one, uh, we expect board members to come to the table regardless of how they got there, even if they are representatives of, of um, say, constituent bodies, they're expected to think for themselves. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a factor that's uh, closely related to politics because a consequence of, a, of uh, individuals agreeing to or failing to oppose a group decision even though they're not satisfied with the answers to the questions or the group decision is another source of dysfunctionality. Uh, the final one here is disrupted and manipulated information flows. That is most likely to be a consequence of a loss of trust between board and management or uh, where uh, one or more board members consistently contravenes board protocol calls and confidentiality. I worked with one of the district health boards where one of its members uh, consistently contravened confidentiality protocols uh, and uh, in the end uh, not only were his colleagues very frustrated with him uh, but the chief executive said to the board one day quite formally, uh, I cannot do my job because I cannot trust you. He said, I do not want to read about everything I tell you, much of which is confidential on the front page of tomorrow's newspaper. There are other things as well. Uh, marginalisation refers to the situation where one or more individuals are effectively excluded from group decision making. Uh, it's usually a consequence of them uh, having unpopular views, and that's a decision-making problem, obviously. Uh, but it also might relate to the status differentials issue uh, that I referred to earlier. Social loafing is, is a, a term that I think is quite, uh, quite cute uh, in some ways. Uh, it, it's a phenomenon that, that I think probably those of you who've been on larger boards would have uh, observed. It is usually associated with larger boards and it's because uh, individual board members don't think that their contribution to the board's process is either as valued or as significant 
all that it will be missed if they decide to miss the odd meeting or two. So it's often associated with erratic attendance and also uh, relatively low levels of contribution uh, when that person is present. Uh, distraction, uh, it's a broad term, but it's when boards find it very difficult to concentrate on substantive matters because their energy and their attention is being consumed by conflict. That conflict is usually a consequence of a loss of confidence and trust in senior executives uh, or because of the dysfunctional behaviour of one or more of their own colleagues around the board table. Um, a symptom often of uh, a malfunctioning board is the um, increased turnover in key uh, executives, including the chief executive, but particularly the senior executives, and not only the chief executive, but uh, uh, chief financial officer, for example, who are typically uh, involved in board meetings. Uh, they, uh, they will move on uh, if the board is not functioning well. And the other one is uh, where there are dysfunctional group norms or values. Uh, and they may not be explicitly uh, designed to be dysfunctional. And I'll talk about a process later on that you might use to try and address some of those issues. Um, but simply where uh, norms of behaviour, in other words, typical and accepted behaviours, uh, are distracting and dysfunctional. I want to talk now about some of the things that relate to um, board dynamics and just the way groups of people um, make decisions together that impact on the quality of those decisions. So the, the first one I want to refer to is often referred to as the shared information bias. So uh, groups of individuals can pull their individual knowledge and expertise to considerable advantage and that's while we often say uh, that, that boards are more effective than any individual, provided they can apply their collective uh, uh, intelligence uh, and, and knowledge and experience to a particular issue. There's a tendency, though, in groups uh, like boards to spend too much time examining information that many of the group members already know in common. It's, it's shared information. And that occurs because Discussing shared information is much more likely to make the group feel it is working towards a consensus and agreement. It's reinforced because most people argue in favour of their own personal preferences and resist changing their minds, and because the desire to maintain harmonious relations with fellow group members is greater than the desire to explore all aspects uh, of the decision. So the outcome is typically a flawed decision. Uh, and had there been consideration of uh, unshared information, in other words, information that was not brought to the table, it might have led to a totally different conclusion. So there are some remedies around that. It may be that the group is a bit too cosy and, and its members are too similar to each other. So altering the board's composition can help protect about, uh, against that and refreshing the board's membership from time to time will also bring hopefully some, some fresh eyes and, and thoughts to uh, group challenges. Uh, extending the time available for discussion, you know, some really important board discussions and decisions get very rushed uh, and that also obviously limits uh, the amount of information that can be brought to bear and the amount of time that a board is willing to spend exploring a wider range of, of thinking on a, on a topic. Uh, one of the uh, structural process uh, tools that you can use is that of the devil's advocate. Uh, and that person's job is to basically uh, you know, uh, criticise or, or push uh, the board really hard to explain and justify its predominant thinking pattern. Uh, there are other tools and techniques. Some of you might be familiar with... Uh, the, uh, the Bono Six Thinking Hats uh, tool. The Black Hat, uh, a critical thinking option, is another way of thinking about that particular remedy. And another thing that some of you may have experienced, uh, and I've seen work quite well, is to use some of the group decision-making uh, systems, computer-based systems, where 
people sit in a room uh, in front of computer screens, uh, a facilitator poses a question or a challenge, and uh, individually each participant contributes their views without being aware of what other people are contributing at the same time. So uh, it's only when the uh, information is all brought together you can see where the differences in thinking are, and it reduces the the likelihood that people will just uh, follow uh, early speakers like sheep uh, in, in that decision-making process. A second uh, problem uh, is what's called pluralistic ignorance, uh, which is not quite interesting term. Uh, it exists where members of a group hold varied opinions or beliefs but do not express them in the mistaken belief that they are inconsistent with the opinions of others in the group. So it prompts people to conform to group norms that don't exist except in their own confused minds. It, it stems from the natural human tendencies both to overestimate the extent to which uh, their views differ uh, from group norms and to want to be seen as a cooperative member of the group. Some of you might be familiar with the uh, story of the Abilene Paradox where a group of family members went on a journey that none of them wanted to go on and that's a very good demonstration of this particular concept. Some of you, I think some of my early comments might have been thinking that that related to group think uh, as a concept uh, and you would be right, uh, some of the things I've already said to are closely related to group think. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, group thinks a consequence of group pressures often because of a desire to maintain group cohesion, in other words not to rock the boat. Uh, or it may be a consequence of decision making time pressures where uh, a group is really anxious to make a decision because of deadlines and therefore very reluctant to uh, acknowledge uh, contrary views or weaknesses uh, in, in proposals. It's usually manifested in the failure of the group to seek or accept information or advice which runs counter to the dominant group view or preference. So some of those status differentials I referred to before can also come into play here. Uh, group things also encouraged by perceived or actual threats to continued membership of the group. Um, many boards are such that people actually have a strong desire to join those, uh, those boards for various reasons uh, in terms of their own personal objectives and, and their own perceptions of, of status and inclusion and the like. So, we can counter group thinking in a number of ways, and I just included some examples here. So, membership diversity, of, uh, so that was uh, what I referred to previously. Uh, keep the, uh, the membership of the board uh, turning over, not, not to the point of instability, obviously, but just to ensure that uh, it doesn't become uh, too stale and uh, its, its members um, uh, lose their um, their desire and their uh, intent to challenge each other. Another one is, is just to uh, get engaged in a sort of conversation we're having this morning uh, to heighten awareness of the impact of group dynamics and of some of the things that need to be done uh, to uh, ensure that those group dynamics are positive. I think this also is the, the added benefit of taking some of the pressure off the chair if the chair is the only person that uh, is, in a sense, responsible for the quality of group dynamics, then that will be an uphill task, whereas if everyone is, there's the basis for some shared discipline around some of these things. Again, processes like the devil's advocate referred to earlier, um, and other techniques that might uh, help introduce and validate uh, countervailing information and contrary views. I think another really important thing that comes back to chair again is to um, exercise really active process facilitation and to, to continually remind people of some of the challenges and the traps of falling into the sort of group think mode. Um, and the final one that I've included here is, is to have a really structured decision making process. So that's something that goes through a number of explicit steps which include a 
uh, to, uh, a step for you know, consciously divergent uh, thinking around differences and uh, even to the point of, of bringing in outsiders to bring new information and, and to challenge the board's own thinking as part of that decision making process. Um, another thing that I found is quite useful is to uh, ensure that it's a two-step process. So if the board has to make an important decision, don't just try and do it all in one hit. Uh, have uh, a paper or proposal brought to the board at one meeting, uh, kick it around a wee bit, and consciously um, engage in some divergent thinking. What, for example, uh, there's a great story told about General Motors where they were about to make uh, a bet the farm decision and the, the chair said, uh, look, we're obviously all in agreement here, uh, but let's just uh, park this decision until our next meeting and, and in the meantime, go away and think of as many reasons as you can why we shouldn't make this decision. Interestingly, when they reconvened, they made quite a different decision to the one that they would have made if they had decided the previous meeting. There are a number of consequences of a board's inability to handle conflict successfully. Now, just as a bit of a preamble, I think it's worth noting that um, boards often seem to, and this is a, to some degree a New Zealand trait, because we've seen differences in boards that we've worked with outside of New Zealand, but typically New Zealand boards are consensus-seeking boards. And uh, they, they interpret that as avoidance of conflict often. Uh, you know, conflict is awkward, it's uncomfortable, uh, and it's a barrier to getting a decision made. So often we, I think, um, without even being aware of it, uh, suppress or avoid conflict, uh, or worse, become totally distracted by it where it does surface, rather than seeing conflict in some form or other as being very valuable to a board's uh, decision-making process. I think we do know, though, need to be really clear that the conflict that I'm talking about is the conflict of ideas, not the conflict of personalities. It's likely the board's not even aware that within its culture, within its uh, norms of behaviour, there are governing values that cause or at least contribute to the inability to handle conflict successfully. Uh, if there's a mindset, for example, that good governance deals only with visible, measurable facts, and that a board member who interrupts proceedings to ask a question based on um, intuition, so, you know, I have this feeling, uh, we like to see those people as a nuisance. If there is a belief that emotions are uncomfortable or even dangerous, we unconsciously punish anyone who voices or demonstrates an emotion that causes us discomfort. So that's what I mean by objectivity at all costs. Another common uh, governing value is uh, win, don't lose. And, and that applies uh, around the board table uh, between individual board members. Uh, and it also applies between the board and the management team. Um, and we all know that those sorts of win-lose outcomes are counterproductive and they're ultimately undermining. Always main control, or maintain control refers to uh, another problem. And as a governing value, uh, we can all think, I, I'm, I'm sure, of people that we've worked with who are what we would loosely call control freaks and we know how dysfunctional that can become and disempowering for others who are involved. Avoiding embarrassment, I guess, flows on from, uh, from the win-lose win, uh, thing, uh, but not just that. Uh, but if we are in the sort of mode where individually and collectively we want to avoid embarrassment, that prevents important ideas and information getting on the table for the board to process. Uh, this can be tied up with uh, uh, the way uh, people ask questions or don't, uh, more to the point. So uh, I can't emphasise enough the importance of what some people refer to as dumb questions, uh, I prefer to think of them as intelligently naive questions, but uh, often what prevents people from asking any questions is the fear that their question will be seen as dumb or they will be laughed at or 
uh, yep, there'll be eyes rolling because everyone else thinks uh, that uh, the individual who's asked the question should already know the answer to it. So uh, be very alert to those sorts of governing values. One of the, the, the problems with them is that they often lead to not only conflict but a fear of failure and uh, we all know the typical uh, response to fear. It's either fight or flight. I think there's a third one too, and that is I see uh, board members in conflict situations often freezing. You know, it's the possum in the headlights type of thing. So I want to just share with you a process that I have used uh, successfully where there have been these sorts of uh, board dynamic problems, where there have been um, governing uh, values or, or group norms that have been counterproductive in relation to, to the board dynamic. Uh, and this is a process that, that I remember very well the first time I used it, it was with a city council. And uh, we asked uh, all the council members to write on a sheet of butcher's paper what they uh, saw and experienced as the norms of behaviour uh, around the council table. So it was just to, to describe what they saw going on in a typical council meeting without judging whether it was uh, a good thing or a bad thing. As it happened, uh, and it was a reasonably large council, about 14 I think, uh, we had a, around 20 sheets of butcher's paper that we uh, blue tacked around the wall of the conference room and, and worked our way around these various sheets uh, exploring what uh, council members had said and trying to find the, amongst those various norms of behaviour those things that they all agreed were positive uh, norms and ways of behaviour and separating those from the dysfunctional ones. Uh, actually, at the end of that process, we couldn't have filled one sheet of butcher's paper with positive norms. All the rest of it was totally negative. Uh, that's perhaps an extreme example, but you might find it quite useful to undertake the same sort of process yourself, and it's described briefly on this slide. So start with identifying the unwritten rules or norms that operate in the boardroom, which just simply as in the example I gave you, describe behaviours as you observe them and then uh, discuss those um, rules or norms and agree which of them the board would like to adopt in a positive sense as part of a form of job design. Um, then, then discuss and add uh, desirable behaviours that, that perhaps are missing and which would be uh, more positive, more constructive and, and achieve a better um, board dynamic. And then finally, uh, codify them in some way if you can. So agree and uh, pledge sounds uh, a little bit unusual, but actually uh, there is a legal requirement for members of local authorities, just to follow on from my previous example. They have to pledge a number of things, including uh, loyalty to the city or the region or the, or the district as a whole. Um, and they also are required uh, under the Local Government Act to adopt, in other words, pledge to an agreed code of behaviour. Uh, so it's something that you may well uh, finish up with at the end of a process like this, it's some sort of agreed code of conduct or, or code of behaviour. Even just having that conversation, if, even if you don't get as far as the code, I think you might find beneficial just as a form of, of sort of good housekeeping. Um, just to get you started in thinking about what some norms of behaviour that support a positive and, and, and effective board dynamic might be, I've just put a few things on this slide. So uh, civility, I think, is a very important thing. I, I'm surprised how often I do hear board members um, becoming personal, making ad hominem attacks on each other, uh, speaking uh, rudely to each other and to management. Uh, from my point of view, I've never seen a board that's functional that indulges in that sort of sniping. So courtesy and working with your colleagues seems to be a pretty basic requirement when we're thinking about good board dynamics. Um, and if people are polite and respectful of each other, even if they might have 
very basic disagreements with them uh, philosophically or in relation to a particular issue. Uh, politeness always sets uh, the right sort of tone and encourages people to be more open and to, to share their thinking. Um, something which not all boards seem comfortable with is taking risks and uh, I think we can think of that in a, in a wide range of, of ways but I'm thinking here particularly in terms of a willingness to take risks as an individual in sharing your thoughts, even though you anticipate they may be disagreed with uh, or, or um, really not appreciated, I think you have an obligation to take that sort of risk. And the reference to, to venturing into intellectual terror incognito is, is just taking risks as a group and, and individually uh, to explore some areas that you really don't know what the outcome is going to be. Uh, you know, it's a bit like the uh, the early explorers, um, you know, potentially sailing off the edge of the world. If we can do that in an intellectual sense, it would be great around the board table. Um, the final one that I've got here is uh, what I've referred to as a genuine appreciation of diversity. There's a lot of talk, both in, uh, nationally and, and internationally, around the need to increase diversity around board tables. The focus of it, unfortunately, has tended to be Simply, and I don't say this because it's wrong, but focus on gender diversity. Uh, and uh, I fully support that. And uh, in fact, I think that uh, women around board tables are often much better, to, uh, better able uh, for lack of the same ego problems that males have uh, to ask those sorts of dumb uh, questions that I was referring to before. But uh, I won't comment any further on that case. I've dug myself a hole already. I don't want to make it any deeper. I'm, what I'm seeing around board tables is the absolute necessity, for example, to improve age diversity. Uh, you know, there are things going on uh, in the technology space and, and uh, in terms of, of changing social uh, norms and that sort of thing, where it's really important that we've got a good age distribution around our board tables. And obviously in New Zealand, it's really important for us to reflect the cultural or ethnic diversity of New Zealand in our board tables. And we're a long, long way off, off uh, achieving that at the present time. If we've got a genuine, genuine appreciation of diversity, we really welcome and want to take full advantage of those differences uh, and uh, obviously our decision making is going to be greatly improved if we can get that diversity playing out uh, in the boardroom. One of the things that just in, in relation to um, how you might progress some of the things I have been talking about, uh, I, I expect that a number of the participants in the webinar today will have the benefit of, of a board charter or a board job description or some similar documentation which sets expectations around board dynamics. Um, an increasingly common component of such charters is some sort of philosophical statement, partly about desirable behaviours, but also generally about the way the board wants to operate uh, and how it might take advantage of uh, things like uh, diversity, but also it would, how it would re re uh, reinforce uh, some of those um, desirable norms of behaviour like uh, those referred to on, on this, uh, this slide. So if you haven't got that document, <coughs> it's very valuable just simply to start the conversation. If you start off with a draft, perhaps even an example of what another board has already adopted. Oh, so there are some other desirable cultural and social system characteristics that I would also like to refer to as we progress. And they've been implied a wee bit in some of the earlier comments that I've made. But to start with, with uh, the first one, listening to constructive mavericks uh, or dissenters. I think sometimes we're too quick to, uh, to, to style somebody, to, to categorise them as dysfunctional when they are simply people who are uh, willing and able to express a contrary view. I think we've got to be quite careful uh, that we don't uh, marginalise, which was another one of the, the uh, matters that I referred to earlier, that we don't marginalise people just because 
they may be willing to express contrary views uh, or ask uh, difficult and awkward questions. Uh, and the chair has a really important role here in making it possible for those people to be heard and not to be uh, ignored uh, or, or put down. Uh, following on from my previous comments, I think to be really clear that we're celebrating difference in diversity, not only in terms of board members' characteristics, but in terms of difference and diversity in thinking and, and ideas. Obviously, and, and we've touched on it earlier in the webinar, encourage participation and encourage people to speak up. And sometimes those of us who tend to um, grab the airtime of a board would sometimes do well to sit back and zip up for a while and actually use our verbal skills to try and draw forth ideas out of those, uh, those people who are usually quieter or who might just process information differently to us. Uh, you know, it's not uncommon to find that people on board who are very quiet. It's not that they do not have something useful to say, it's just that they need to work it around in their heads uh, and try and uh, get the words in order, so to speak, before they are willing uh, to expose those ideas. In contrast, of course, many of us uh, don't know what we're thinking until we've uh, voiced it. So, uh, the chair has a particular um, um, challenge in, in balancing those things up. Uh, obviously, uh, collective uh, value should be that we encourage examination and challenge of assumptions and beliefs. Uh, I, I'm a great fan of a process called dialogue, which is quite different to uh, that of debate. Debate tends to be more of a contest. Dialogue is about bringing a whole bunch of different pieces of a jigsaw puzzle together and putting them together and understanding an issue uh, and arriving at good decisions because we have all contributed something that others around the table didn't have. Um, avoid typecasting. I was referring to that before in relation to the first of the bullet points on this slide. Uh, and it's not just typecasting uh, individuals as mavericks or dissenters, but in other ways as well that might uh, lead us to be less uh, uh, anxious to hear their views or might even be disrespectful of, of their views. And uh, as I have said previously, uh, a diverse board membership and one that is regularly refreshed is pretty important as well. You can use scenarios as well uh, to force attention to alternate realities. Uh, I like to think of scenarios as being uh, deliberately articulated alternative uh, views of what the future might uh, contain and to then work through those as a board. Uh, uh, it's not worst case, best case scenarios, it is just uh, different views of the future that might be equally plausible but force us to think about things that we would not otherwise bring to the decision making process. Uh, boards need to have adequate time to do this and I think I referred to that earlier. Also, I think much of what I've already described is about designing and applying process that broaden directors' thinking. Inviting external challenge, I think, is a great opportunity for boards to bring in external uh, stakeholders, for example, uh, or provocateurs who, who will uh, actually challenge the way the board thinks about things. Uh, and force it to really think things through in a way that it might not otherwise do. And it looks like I've got really repetitive about diverse board membership, so I'll skip that. Uh, the final thing I want to refer to there is just active performance review. Uh, many of you do this already, but use the board and director review process um, to really identify any areas of board dynamics that might need tuning up. And uh, finally, if I can just uh, suggest to you that uh, you should take some personal responsibility uh, for addressing the sorts of things that we've been talking about. Uh, you know, we, we, we often know that we're right, but actually uh, <laughs> it doesn't always turn out that way. Uh, so when everybody around the table knows that they're right, then it's a fast road to gridlock. Be, be conscious um, when you have stopped listening to people for example, um, uh, and, and just really try hard to, to change that in, into 
um, maybe even write down the things that other people are saying and then ask questions that will tease uh, them out. Think about your emotional tone. If you can, sort of listen to the tone in which you're asking questions, for example. It's very easy for questions to become bullets that you're firing at other people if you express them in, in, a, in the wrong sort of tone. Boards that are in conflict often can get back to something like a positive um, mode of operation if they go back and focus on what they agree on rather than what they disagree on and then move forward from that. And finally, just um, you know, know when you're trying too hard to, to uh, convince your colleagues or to make a point, perhaps think about, in a sense, backing down uh, and reflecting on what you're saying and how you're saying it and how it might come across to your colleagues. So Helen, that was all I had to say. Um, we've got a little bit of time for questions. I'm sorry that I've kept going a wee bit over Lovely. time. Lovely. Thanks very much, Graham. And um, we do have quite a range of questions in the public chat box on the left-hand side. I did wonder if we were running out of time, whether or not we could um, circulate those questions in an email to people with perhaps um, a short answer from you. But um, yeah. Yep. I mean, Steve Thomas from Arsenal. I'm Arsenal's happy to do that, Helen. Would, would you be happy to do that? I'm just yeah, thinking that I know that. people have other commitments. Um, so, uh, I mean, I think... There's, there's a couple I don't of questions that I could answer very yeah. quickly if you want to yeah. do too. Lovely. Yeah, do um, that. That would be great if you want to have a look at them. About, about board membership size. Uh, he's absolutely right. All the uh, social science research suggests that groups uh, know... No smaller than five or six and, and no, no larger than about eight or nine is the optimal size. And uh, for those of you whose maths uh, are up to it, you might easily work out how, as each additional board member is added to a group, how the number of potential exchanges that might occur between them increases almost geometrically. So, it's, and, and the curve goes up really steeply after you get into uh, uh, board size over 10. So definitely uh, agree with him on that. Uh, and, um, and the next one from Shona was about whether it's acceptable for board members to only attend meetings and not contribute to any agreed work plans. Now it's not acceptable uh, because board members are there to contribute their own thoughts and their own information and if they're not uh, part of uh, both sharing information and ideas and processing those, then uh, there's a fundamental question about why they're on the board at all. I think we perhaps need to leave it at that point and we can mm. respond to the other questions in writing. Helen. That's lovely. Thank you very much, Graham. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today and for being so patient and bearing with us through the uh, technical challenges. Um, we really appreciate there's been so many of you um, on the webinar today and we really hope you are able to put this material to good use. I think it's been a really insightful and fantastic session, so many thanks to you, Graham. Um, we are going to be uh, just putting up a very short survey at the end of the webinar, so if you could take a couple of minutes to complete that, that would be very useful for us. And do join us for the next webinar. It won't be until November. It's Thursday the 19th of November, and the topic will be on board succession and transition. So until then, you know, my special thanks again to Graham and